All right, I'm going to wait just a couple of seconds um, so people can log on um, really quickly um, before we actually dive into this um, live event today. So this is a good opportunity for you to check your sound and make sure that you can hear me as you are listening in. So first of all, I'd like to say good afternoon to everybody and welcome to um, our first, Bunafu's first live event, Artificial Intelligence 101, Navigating This New Landscape for All. So we're gonna do just a really informal, um, interactive discussion about where we are in AI, artificial intelligence, but we are going to focus really on achieving equitable outcomes by embracing a diverse perspective and promoting inclusivity as we're talking about artificial intelligence, this new technology that we're hearing about on the news, that we're seeing on different platforms and different uses. And um, so I'm so excited to be able to do this webinar. And I'm going to introduce our, you know, really our expert um, that's here who's going to help us really walk through. Um, and we're just going to really talk about the basics as far as artificial intelligence. Um, but before do, we do that, I do want to introduce myself. I'm Jennifer Dunn. I am the founder and CEO of Bunifu Learning for Life. We are a, a training and development um, company and we really focus on training and development especially for underrepresented populations we want to make sure that diversity equity and inclusion is in the forefront for training and development so the backgrounds of diverse um, peoples are very very important to us and that's why um, as we're talking about artificial intelligence today we are going to talk about what does that mean for folks that are underrepresented, for people of color, for those who are, have lower social economic levels? And what does that impact mean? So we have, like I said before, we have um, Devonay Day, who is a strategic, strategic partner with Bunifu Learning for Life. And I do wanna read a little bit about his background because it's so, so impressive. And um, I think it really lays the foundation on how we're going to walk through today's live event. So um, Devin A is an engineer. He's been an engineer for 25 years. Um, he has experience in driving innovation as a leading technology company. He has helped design and implement cutting edge systems that power our connected world across telecommunications and automation. Currently, he leads projects leveraging artificial intelligence to optimize broadband networks and transform electric vehicle charging through intuitive human computer interface patents. His passion and talent for inventing systems of tomorrow have delivered advanced solutions in enhancing productivity, productivity across multiple industries. Also, I just want to say he has also gone gone to school at MIT, their design and professional, um, their artificial design, artificial and intelligence design professional education program. Um, so I'm so excited to have you. Welcome, um, Devonay. Okay. Uh, um, so I'm going to, I'm going to have you, first of all, before you start, Devonay, I do want you to talk about two projects before we dive in um, that you work with artificial intelligence, because I think it's going to help us as we lead this conversation. So go ahead and talk about the super 911 and also the credit score. Okay. First, uh, I'll just make a little correction. I got my engineering degree from Drexel University and also I did a certificate at MIT in uh, AI design, designing product and services. So I just want to make sure I put that in there. Thank you. So that said, uh, like Jennifer said, the fact, first of all, thank you, Jennifer, for organizing this webinar. Currently, I'm involved in two projects. Both are in a data phase. First one, we are trying or we are testing plugin at the architecture and browser level specially crafted to provide insight into 
how a prompt utilized by a large language model. What I'm talking about there is things like ChatGPT. These plugins scrutinize users' prompt and provide guidance on how to enhance them. And let me put it in a layman term. If you are using large language model like ChatGPT, our tool will evaluate your prompt and suggest improvement. Parents or businesses can utilize it to monitor which language model their children or workers are using and what prompt they are entering. And let me say that this is not a punitive application, it's a way to assist people in prompting better because later on you are going to learn that your prompt and your data is very important in the AI domain. Uh, additionally, I'm here hearing a project called Super 911. To, uh, to put in a few words, it just means that we are integrating AI and the first respondents in a real time to improve emergency response for 911 calls, particularly for people with, or individuals with uh, mental health issues. And, uh, this product is in, under the, still in development, but it's uh, showing a lot of promises. So those are the main two projects that I spend my time on. Of course, I also work on how to deploy an electric vehicle charger using AI. So I'll say two main projects that are in the base of beta phase are the prompt, the plugin, and also the Super 911. Thank you, Jennifer. So, you know, I just wanted um, Devin A to highlight those two um, projects um, that he's been working on because I, you know, I just think of the power of technology and automation and how um, it's impacting what we're doing today. And there's so many benefits, but today we are going to talk about the challenges around the impact of um, the future work and on our school of the day of AI. And um, these are just some of the benefits that you see on the, scr um, on the screen where we're utilizing AI to translate languages, different languages. We're holding conversations. We're using Siri. I use Siri all the time on my cell phone. We're now going, looking at virtual assistants and how it's taking up some of you know, the work jobs um, that we're seeing in the future. Um, grammar correction, summarizing, writing articles, um, chat bots, um, and chat GPT, which you are here, you've heard a lot about that many people have downloaded that app. But I just wanted to highlight these because these are just some of the platforms and benefits, but there's so much more that is out there. And I think we have to think about what does that mean for us for the future of work? And also, what does that mean for us as a community and as a world, as an America? What do, how do these technology advancements really impact um, our everyday living? So I'm gonna go ahead and move toward, um, uh, so when I talk about um, impacting our everyday living, um, the Biden administration um, did put out a press release and they actually drafted a 73 page document. It's a blueprint for an AI, artificial intelligence bill of rights. So they have felt a need to write a document that this extensive to talk about what, how these technology advances such as artificial intelligence has ch can challenge and pose a challenge to our democracy today to our certain freedoms and i think that we really need to think about as organizations as schools as educators um, as we're utilizing these tools how can they be a threat to the american public um, if you see here on the screen there are five squares or rectangles um, here and and they really, if you look at this document and you read it, you'll see that um, it talks about safe and effective systems and how, as organizations, we need to put policies and guidelines in place, uh, logarithms and how discrimination 
um, can occur. We're going to talk a little bit of more about that. Devonay is going to expound a, a little bit of, about what that means as far as, you know, discrimination and biases. Um, data privacy. You know, this is data collected um, from all over. Do we know what type of data has been collected and what are the privacies of individuals um, and organizations? Um, and then notices and explanation. How are organizations actually saying this is where the data is coming from? And we'll talk a little bit about that um, later. So I'm going to go ahead. I just wanted to really look at this because it's important that we have everybody in this conversation so we don't leave folks out. And, and we'll give a little bit more of an explanation, but if you get an opportunity, the um, URL is right there on the screen so you can actually download and read if you have not already this um, AI Bill of Rights. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to um, Devin A, who's gonna talk about, you know, give us the basics of AI. So what is AI? Okay, thank you again, Jennifer. Now, first, I'm going to apologize in advance that this part of the presentation is going to be a little bit technical. I'm going to try to make it uh, very simple, but one of the things that I want everybody to understand is at the end, you only need to remember two or three things, and you understand the technology. So, uh, this is second, please. Sorry. Something okay, so everybody knows ever since computers were invented, they, they are primarily serve as machine, advanced machine. They execute precise instruction that programmers wrote, developed the right program in different languages. That's what computers used to do. And the concept of artificial intelligence emerged in the 1950s. And the aim is to make things behave like human. So any technique that in enable computers or machine to mimic human behavior is called artificial intelligence. So everybody, so we want the computers to behave like a, like a human. So one of the first thing that happened was they create a programmers start to teach the machine. Again, I'm going to use the word machine and computer as the same thing, because if you see any machine, there is a computer in there. So when I say computer, I mean machine. When I say machine, I mean computers. So programmers teach machine, like computers, to learn from example, like even learn from experience. So as you have a child, you train your child, or you have your pet, you train your child, so they train the machine to learn like human by showing different patterns. Now, that is the first thing called machine learning. Machine learning has been around for a while. And another field of machine learning that AI that was around for around, around is computer vision. I think you probably have heard a long time ago something about us. Eliza. Eliza was developed in the mid uh, 1960s. And the goal is just to mimic human like a conversation to understand. We are, every day we, in this life now, we are using AI. Whenever you see a YouTube suggestion, you receive a, a mortgage approval or, or deny or get a credit card, credit card application accepted or rejected, you are experiencing what we call traditional AI. When the iRobot or what you call the Roomba autonomously vacuum your house, that AI at work a different form. That kind of robot utilizes machine learning and computer vision, vision technology to perceive and interact with the environment. Now, I know this is going too far, but the two things, what is, how does the machine learn? machine learn when the program is created an algorithm. That algorithm is just like a recipe. Think of this thing as a chef. Chef write a recipe. What does the chef need to cook? He needed ingredients. So in this, if you don't remember anything, remember that the algorithm that they create to teach the machine 
it's just like a recipe created by, uh, like a recipe created by the chef and what is they train the machine on they train them they train with data the data is the ingredients so that that is the first part then we have been in that stage of ai for a long time but recently uh we we started to hear word like uh deep learning generative ai natural language processing large language model they are all a soul field of ai because another version of uh, machine learning technique is called artificial neural network and artificial neural network are key tool in the world of machine learning inspired by by how our brain process information just like the neuron in our brain brain function artificial neural network artificial neural consists of artificial nodes that work together to analyze data learn from example and recognize pattern so but we know that neural network have been around to, uh, for a long time what make it create this revolution is how, how i would say that how what make neural network came and it was under the radar for a long time until the computing power they started to build the computers can process a large amount of data and thanks to processes like a graphic uh, process uh, unit developed by some company like Indivia. now that the de uh, developers or scientists come to a point that oh now we can we have a computing power we can use this neural network use multiple of them to create to grant uh, to process more data to teach machine so that multiple neural network multiple artificial neural network is called deep learning network which is the backbone of deep learning deep learning is with deep learning another exciting development came along which is generative ai i know you heard about that this technology focus on creating models that can generate new data samples such as images and i know everybody here about generative ai but you have to remember one thing that's one of the technology all these that do to what the advancement in what computing power and a better better algorithm algorithm which has like a better recipe and a data so after uh after generative AI, we have natural language processing. Natural language processing, I know this is going to be a little bit, like I said, a little bit confusing, but natural language processing is computers are now able to understand how human talk and express themselves. With that, another technology came along called large language model. Large language models are very exciting. They are part of generative AI. They focus on creating model that can generate new data samples such as images resembled one that we were trained on and ai you can use ai to do practically anything like you can ask ai which is a large language model to create a picture for you will do it for you and what is large language model large language model is like chat gpt like google bar it's like um, um, microsoft Bing. So if everything that we just discussed, they are all they all fall under one thing, artificial intelligence machine learning. So remember, the key things you need to remember here is you cannot control the recipe, you can you cannot control the programming, you cannot control the algorithm. But one thing that is very important, even for the chef to make a good food, is the ingredients, but you can control the data. So I'll stop there for now and I'll give it back to Jennifer. So remember, you when you heard a word like machine learning, generative AI, natural language processing, large language model, they are all a soul fill of AI. Thank you, Jennifer. You know, it's so interesting how you put that the metaphor about the recipe. Um, and you don't have necessarily control of the programmers or those who are, you know, cooking up the recipe, right? And I think 
that's what we we need to really you know be cognizant about as organizations as we're utilizing these tools i mean yes i utilize ai i even have a sales tool that actually pulls in data from other places in order to make sure that i can sell to the right target audience for my business um, it makes it so much easier um, using all of these tools. It are very, very beneficial, but I think it's also important to understand what is, who is writing that recipe and who is, how are we controlling or putting borders or um, guidelines for folks as they're creating these recipes. So then that brings me to um, thinking about um who is actually sitting at the table <laughs> um creating these tools and looking and um, filtering the data to make sure that it's accurate or make sure that there's not any biases or anything that's in the information that we're getting through these um, various platforms and artificial intelligence and i'm making it so much simpler than what you just said um, Devin a, but I do think that it is a responsibility and that we have to take a pledge. Um, both businesses and companies um, have a fundamental responsibility to make sure that products are safe before they are deployed or made to the public. And I think that's why there is a bill of uh, rights that came out because we need to make sure organizations are doing that and are they doing that because technology is changing so quickly um, we talk about schools and districts ensuring that the highest values are reinforced in the uses of technology and the bill of rights does talk about what do we do for safeguards of our young people our students our educators as we are moving toward this fast moving um you know um technologies so I do want to say that just to, to end this slide, to transition back to you, Devin A, because I do want you to talk about biases and hallucinations in um, artificial intelligence or generative AI, what you call the deep learning um, that we've now transformed into. Um, but the first thing is, is that we have to have researchers, we have to have community members, we have to have um, people that are diverse, that are reflective of the American people that are sitting at the table as we are creating. Who has access? How are we filtering information for hiring, for medical, you know, um, medical approval, or for, uh, like you said, the credit, <laughs> credit or house hunting? Any of these things that are coming up, how are they being filtered and how is the data being um, looked at? So I do want you to talk a little bit um, in this next slide, um, in this diagram about the biases and the bias reinforcement loop. Okay. Thank you, Jennifer. Like we were talking about before, like Jennifer said, is machine learning or AI depend on the data. They train the machine with the data. So we're going to be now I'm going to talk about calling it training data. It's worth asking question. Where does this training data come from? The data come from the Internet. As you know, this information or data from the Internet often reflects human biases. Whether conscious or unconscious. I'm going to give one example. A medical researchers can use medical images as a training data to teach computers how to recognize and diagnose diseases. diseases. Machine learning needs hundreds and thousands of images and training direction from the doctor who know what to look for before he can correctly diagnose the disease. The disease. Even with the thousands of examples that are, there can be problem with the computer prediction. If they, why? Because if X-ray data is collected only from men, then the computer prediction may only work for men. It may not recognize diseases when to diagnose the S the, the disease when asked to diagnose uh, X-ray of a woman. That's very important. And it's not only the data itself. 
it's also important to know that biases in the AI system isn't solely a result of a biased data. The individual creating the algorithm can also be biased, even if it's unintentional. For instance, consider a developer building an AI to, re to review job application, determine which candidate should be interviewed. If the developer choose or the developer's boss tell him to choose to, to prioritize a certain keywords and phrases, they believe they, they believe significance will that give them a strong applicant. That may be unintentional. The system unintentionally will favor candidate with a specific background, university or industry while putting others at uh, disadvantage. Now, the key thing is biases in general. When you train a system with biased data, what happened? The model learned from biased data present during the training. The model would generate biased result output when I mean I put here, I'll say when you type in something in that little window on your chat GPT or your Google bag, what do you get out is the output is the result. If that data is biased, you're going to get a biased result. People learn and use biases data. Let's say you then use that data that you the output you get and you put it back to the system. What is going to happen? It's going to go back and retrain itself. Remember, the machine train itself based on the data. So when the data you put in, it is retrain itself. So it is going to constant loop. And it is so good coming, good go out, go back coming, bad come back. It is going to loop. So that is the that's the reason why it's very really important to know what to know what you are doing and ask the right question when you are trying to interface with some of this uh, large language model system. Now, I know nobody's going to be able to call chat GPT or Google Bar to ask a quick question, but and they have a place you can read it and find more information. We will talk about that later. How do we address these biases? It's essential to carefully examine the training data and ask critical questions. And now I'm talking about, let's say you are working for a company and they want to adopt one of these large language models, you have to be able to ask this question. Is the data sufficient? Is the data diverse enough to ensure a biased prediction? Does, does it represent all potential scenarios and users fairly? I know people talk about diversity. This is very important. By actively addressing this question, you can work towards reducing biases I'm not saying you can eliminate it, but because we are dealing with human beings, so you may not be able to eliminate it, but you can reduce it. And the, the goal is to ultimately improve the, the accuracy and the fairness, fairness and the effectiveness of the system. Now, for on the industry, industry side, one of the stuff that goes on is constant auditing of the generative AI model. The, there is a paper, if anybody want to read, we can send it out. And we'll talk about three pillars. One is a government audit. What does that mean? So it's when these companies put their model in there, when they train their model, are they constantly reviewing the model for biases, for limitation, and trying to fix them? And at the application level, the result people are getting and putting back to the system, how are they auditing that? when some information that you know that are bad and they come in, how are, how are you doing taking care of that application? And the model itself, how are you, how are, how are they training? How are they training? Who are they? What are they, everybody represented? Remember the output is, in, I always, I know I'm going too long, but let me tell you a quick story. Uh, uh, before you go into that quick story, Devin, mm -hmm. we had two questions. We had two okay. questions that came in sure. and I do, I think it. We have to talk it, about hallucination too. So go ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, we had two questions that came in. One, and I think you answered it already, but I just want to make sure um, we get to it. So, where is the information that is accessed to create 
um, AI gener generated answers coming from? Where uh, is the question? Where is, where is the information? Where is the information that is accessed to create AI generated answers coming from? Okay, so let's put it this way: it's just like they are training this machine, so they did not. It, they don't provide specific answers, so so they train the machine with a lot of data. So when they like, when you ask the question, it's just like the way you train a child. Not everything you're going to train the child on, right? But based on experience, the child will be able to perform some tasks. So that's how it works. So there is no that information is they is coming from when how they process your language, natural language processing. And once you process it, you look into how to answer it because he's already trained on that information. Now that's bringing me back to so if I go now and ask Chat GPT or Google uh, some of the other ones like what time is it, what time is it, or what is the weather tomorrow, it's not going to be able to tell me because it's not trained on that data. That so when you look in the word chat GPT, for instance, the word chat is the first one. A G uh, is a generative. The P is pre-trained. That's the key thing. That is pre-trained. So when you ask him something in the future, he's not going to be able to provide it. Mm -hmm. I hope that uh, answered the question. If not, I can always. I'm here to answer the question. Yeah. Yeah, okay. and we'll have we'll have contact information also at the end. And as you can see, my contact information, my email um, is there, so we can always. Um, get additional details. And this is the first of many. We're going to talk about how you can actually utilize the services that we're going to provide for professional development and policy development. But I do want you to talk about hallucinations and how um, really quickly, and then we need to move on because we're we're um, getting to time. Okay. So, so hallucination is one of those things that we need to talk about. Uh, it's a phenomenon when a model generates an output that are not that are plausible and they sound interesting but inaccurate and sometimes just a pure nonsense. What what makes you hallucinating? It can it can be dangerous. The model can come with more convincing or be more convincing that people will rely on that information. So we need to talk about that. The model can lead to a degradation of uh, degradation of information quality. So hallucination simply just means that you enter some information, a prompt, and you get a wrong answer or it deviates from the fact or the contextual logic. So for instance, if I ask a large language model, again, when I say large language model, I mean things like ChatGPT, Google, Bar, Claude, and all of them to write me a positive review of a restaurant. And in turn, he said the food, is the food was terrible and the service was rude. That is in direct contradiction of what I asked a uh, large language model to do. Another one is, who is the first president of the United States? And he answered, Barack Obama. Another one could be a nonsensical one would be, the capital. what is the capital of France? And it will be, Paris uh, is Paris is a, is also the capital of France is Paris, but Paris is also a name of a famous singer. That's very not, that's a pure nonsense. Thing. So why does machine or large language hallucinate? It's not an easy answer, but because the way they are derived, the the way they get their uh, their result is something of a black box sometimes even to the engineers of some of the people who have been working on this for a long time. But, but there are several common causes. So let me look at a few of them. Let's talk about, let's talk about a few of them. One is when, when you train a large language model, what do you train it with? They scrape all the data from Wikipedia, from Reddit, from social media, from published good, public, uh, published books, sorry. And every, is everything in Reddit 100% accurate? No. So if you are training data that, that depends entirely 
on the data that is not reliable, you're going to get unreliable, unreliable answer. Even if the data, the data may not cover all the possible topic or domain that LLM are expected to generate content. So what I'm saying is, is based on the data that maybe the data is not is not trained well enough, or it doesn't have enough information, or information it is wrong. And the second one, I'm just the second one. The I would just do to time. I'm going to go to one of the most the most important part. One of them is, I say sometimes the engineers they don't know why this machine is listening because first of all we are training this machine to be like a human, right? Mm. And like human, something just goes wrong. People just lie. So you're going to <laughs> you're going to get some wrong answer. And now, quickly, if you want, I have a whole topic on this. So if you want to hear, yeah, I can go on and on. But let me just put it quickly. <laughs> so just tell me that trust by verify whatever you get there. That's why expertise still count. Now, how do we remedy this? And contest matter. Can you contest can help guide the model to produce relevant, accurate information? So let me give you an example. Let's say I gave you an example before telling that Barack Obama is the first president of the United States of America. Maybe before you, the person will get that answer, before you get that answer, he was talking about Black History Month, who is the first black uh, it was the first black Supreme Court justice, and then you ask him who is the first president on the same thread on your chat GPT or the others. You ask him who is the first president of America. Based on the previous thread, you would just say Barack Obama because you are only talking about black people, right? So your context, you ask it in terms of context, so he's going to tell you Barack Obama. Mm. So context is very important. So if you um, if you provide a clear, concise uh, prompt, you get a better result. What can we do to reduce hallucination in our own conversation? So one thing we can do is to provide what clear, specific prompt and a system. Don't just remember large language model when we had when we have a time to talk about it in detail. They are good in they are like you are talking to. A, I would say a human being on the other side without the cognitive ability. That's all mm. you're doing. So when you, if the more detail, when you ask somebody a question, the more detail you have on the question, the better answer you get. So with large language models, we are, once you understand those things, you can really minimize uh, uh, hallucination. But as I said, we want it to be like a human, so we, we should not be surprised if it's act like a human. Thank you, Jennifer. I'll stop yes, that. You know, no, great, because one of the comments that came in from one of the um, listeners was talking about it's important, especially around young people. And, I, you know, I think about um, my 10 year old, but the comment was, how can we teach our young people to critically think this could maybe help? Um, in order to ease the human bias, um, but mitigate some of that and the interpretation of what they're getting back. But I think of my 10 year old who just wants to just use, you know, chat GPT or use something very quickly and just put it in so he can get an answer, right? Or he's using Siri yeah. or Google, Google Voice and he's he's just saying, let me get, let me get an answer. And he trusts what he's getting the information that he's getting and he's using it maybe for a homework assignment or to talk to a friend and he's not thinking about those critical things as 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 um, a young person especially at 10 years old so i think it's important as we think about school developmentally where are our young people at and how do we help them to you know even if they're encountering these things to really critically think about you know um, some of the tools that they're using. I do want to be mindful of time. I do want to hit really quickly this last piece, and I want you to hit this one hard because this is really talking about how do we address biases. Um, if you could go around like organizations, what should organizations do to address biases um, and these hallucination and errors in AI? 
Okay, so organizations, are you talking about, you know, we are talking about organization, we're talking about two different types here. Yeah. Are you yeah? Are you talking about the user or the developer? <laughs> so let's yeah. So let's 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 put it this thinking, way. First, so let's talk about the, the developer. Let's like, talk like chat GPT for instance, okay. because everybody is using their product, right? So you don't have a way of calling chat GPT and say hey, chat GPT this this. So the only question is, I'll give you an example. I am working with a pastor to. I think I said this before to create um, a sermon. So he will write a sermon. We we uh, Chad GPT will help him write a sermon. And what is a Baptist priest? And uh, maybe on one webinar we can invite Lamar to talk. And uh, what we find out is this: whenever the, the sermon comes out, it sounds like a Catholic priest or Protestant uh, uh, pastor, but it doesn't sound like a Baptist minister. You know, the reason why is when the data is that um, abundant for child GPT and a large language model to collect uh, the sermon or the preaching of the Catholic priest and also uh, uh, Protestants. Somebody will say, oh, yeah, we have Baptist people talking all the time on YouTube. That's not what I'm talking about. You can go somewhere and grab all the historical archive of the Catholic Church right now. And put it in, you can't do that with the Baptist. So whenever we do send this when we create a sermon is imitating what uh Kali priests will sound like. So what we did it was yes, we eat he emailed them because he's a big pastor. I'm just an engineering guy here. So what we did was we 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 took a sample of the best Baptist preaching and then we we mimic it, we tell Chad GPT to mimic that that speech that sermon and he's getting now he sound like the speech sound like a, a, a baptist priest so there are some things that they will not they are not going to be able to answer for you but you can do something you gotta know how to use the system to be able to remedy some of this stuff before you look forward and complaining alone is not going to help so the, the reason why you really need to understand what generative AI is and uh, large language model is so you can ask the appropriate question. So from their point of view, I never see a big company that create a system and ethic is their first concern. Most of the time is profit and efficiency. Either you create problem for other people, that's a later one. But this time the government is coming late and they are creating what? They are creating, like you said, Biden and administration created AI safety. And this, when you look at the chart here, is very good. And um, I explain it, but let me say the governance is when the comp there are a lot of papers on that where how the industry to avoid biases. So it's like a continuously auditing the system. And it's not only at the source because a lot of data is still coming back to the system, right? So let's say you audit your system, fine, but the, the bias data the bias data that went out can come back. So you have to continue on to be monitoring the system to be able to weed up all the biases. Now, that could be fine an application level. So when somebody finds something that is very offensive, the system you can put it back to the system. You don't even need to call them. So they can uh, so the model they need to be retuned and refined. There's something. There's a whole field in AI called fine tuning or prompt engineering, which help because to to alleviate some of these issues that society faced in a long time. And I also believe that this is the first time in history that we is not only productivity and efficiency we can talk about how is this this sustainable that so all this thing that's at the developer level at the user level if you work for company or in the school which system is good for you and it's very important that people have to know that although they can ask the developers or the, the people create all this application they have to put use the safety guide to put the laws in places 
Now, now I'm going to create a problem now. The problem now is this. There's, I never see any enforcement yet mm-hmm. in this. So let's say this thing, let's say I was in an elevator. They call this an uh, AI. Oh, I was in the bathroom, rather. And there's no valve to shut down the water because the water keep on running. And they say it's controlled by some cloud AI somewhere. So I just walk out. But there's gonna there's the water all over the bathroom. So we need to start thinking and ask the basic question that you ask normally. Is this thing is autonomous? Why? Who control this? Why this maybe this thing may turn into something to harm me? But there's no enforcement. So we are at the point where Although the rules are there, there's no enforcement. But you know, we are turning back to the people who create the system to create their own enforcement by creating another application to fix the problem they created. So my point here is, yes, governance is fine, retooling is fine, fine-tuning is fine, application audit is fine, but you as a person should have, you have, we all have the questions already. We all know how our elevator used to work. If you call it AI elevator, I want to ask the question, can I see that phone? Uh, can I examine the interface? I can talk to somebody because the phone is not there. So ask the right question. And, and if you understand how the system works, you should be fine. I, I know I'm going too far, but Jennifer, no, I, think, I think it's good, you know, to, to talk about this because we are, you know, if you're looking for services for your organization, we can support you in providing professional development, especially for K-12 um, schools and districts and small businesses around, you know, how do you, what platforms are useful or are actually putting these safeguards or these systems in or trying to put them in. And I think that's the responsibility of the user is to make sure that those are happening. And how is the application of these platforms being used? And then how are we modeling it throughout, you know, um, the different ways and different ways it's affecting the different populations or the different um, types of, you know, people within that organization. So I think it's really important as you think about this this, um, diagram here, how you're, and I'm always thinking about the user. I know, um, Devin, you're always thinking about the developer. I'm thinking about the user who's using the end because I'm the one who's who's using these tools and how can I make sure that they're they're safe to use um, for the public. I do want to move into Q and A, uh, but before we move into the Q and A, I do want to. Um, I this is really hard to see, but uh, there's someone online who's going to put some things in the comments um, about um, that will actually give you the PowerPoint presentation. Um, it also will give you our website as well as our services for AI services. So we are providing for small, medium, and large businesses as well as schools um, some basic AI safety training um, that uh, for uh, the organization that would be virtual. Also, uh, that will go a little bit more in depth than what we did today, and also how to draft ethic AI ethics guidelines and policy. Um, training. So how do you start the process for your organization or school? And then if you have, we always say you should have some type of ongoing advisory or, you know, in school, sometimes it could be the leadership team. In districts, it's the administrative district office, the executive suite team and, um, you know, um, businesses or companies, but what is the ongoing advisory services um, or advisory team? And we can provide and sit and support the advisory team. And so, you know, this will, um, we do have on Linktree and the um, the actual, and I think someone is going to put it in the chat or the comments, but it's, um, and I think they already did, but it's Linktree. Um, tr.ee slash bunifu and you can get like i said the powerpoint presentation um our website and also our um, services we also like to hear how we're doing um so there will be a post event survey for you to complete now i do want to move into i know we only have about five more minutes left 
but I do want to move into some Q&A. If you have some last minute comments or questions that you would like, go ahead and put that in the comments area. Um, one of the questions, which is locating that AI um, bill. Uh, so that is on the PowerPoint presentation. So you can go to um, the whitehouse.gov and get, it's a press release. You can even Google it <laughs> and you can find AI Bill of Rights and it'll come right up and you'll get the 73 page document, the press release, all the different um, safety guards that they want around um, artificial intelligence and automation. Um, um, I don't see any more questions coming through. I think we asked a lot of them throughout the webinar. So I do want to um, really thank you, um, Devonay, to even just starting this conversation um, with us today. And this being our first live event, I was excited to learn more from you and to also um, really see how this intersects with our mission at Bunafu is supporting, um, you know, underrepresented populations, um, underrepresented populations, and how important it is to make sure that we have everyone sitting at the table when we talk about these advancements in technology. Um, I think one comment, okay. Um, so I do want to thank you, um, Devonay, for, for having us. And we're going to go ahead and, and close out. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jennifer, also for providing me the opportunity. Thank you.